It's the night of January 16th, 1991. It's been exactly 5 months and 14 days since the start of the Gulf War. You suspect that the United States Armed Forces is planning an aerial bombing campaign against Iraq, however you don't know when they're going to initiate the operation. How can you find out the exact date? You've already tried to hack into military systems with every traditional cyber attack in the book, but to no avail. It turns out that there's a method to find out without directly breaching military systems, discovered by Frank Meeks, owner of 43 Domino's Pizza Outlets in the Washington, D.C. area. He knows that Operation Desert Storm is going to commence tomorrow, on January 17th, due to the spike in late-night pizza orders from government offices. You see, the night before large military operations, government officials tend to stay up all night planning, ordering in copious amounts of pizza, with Meek stating, I don't think they're sitting around watching Redskins reruns. That night, after 10pm, the White House ordered 55 pizzas, relative to their baseline of 5. Over at the Pentagon, this number surged to 101 pizzas, relative to their baseline of 3. This correlation of government pizza orders and imminent military action was coined the Pizza Index, which also successfully predicted military action ahead of time in many other cases. This is a classic example of a side channel attack, with the pizza orders acting as the side channel. Side channel attacks are based on the observation of unintended omissions of information. Certain information may be leaked due to the fundamental way a protocol or algorithm is implemented, rather than flaws in the design of the protocol or algorithm itself. We're soon going to learn that even though a program's code may be entirely safe and bug-free, this doesn't necessarily mean that the execution of these programs is going to be safe, as the CPU could inadvertently end up leaking information at runtime. These side channels are everywhere, spanning from the analysis of power consumption all the way to being able to extract your own fingerprints just by listening to the acoustic signatures generated by swiping on your phone's touchscreen. In this video, we're going to be diving deep, covering one of the most severe exploits in the history of computation. Tech firms are rushing to patch a security hole that is affecting billions of computers and smartphones. It's caused by two major flaws in computer chips called Meltdown and Spectre. The defect could enable hackers to steal sensitive information from nearly every modern computing device and smartphone. They're the worst computer bugs in history, and they could be coming for your personal information. What if there was a way for any process running on your entire computer, without requiring any elevated permissions or malicious installs, to have free access to all of your system's memory, both from other applications, including different virtual machines, and even from the operating system kernel itself? This means that even the benign, client-side JavaScript running within a browser tab could have full access to all of your computer's memory, being able to recover encryption keys, photos, banking information, or anything else present in your system's RAM. This was the reality in early 2018, when two of the most dangerous and widespread CPU vulnerabilities, Meltdown and Spectre, were discovered by researchers at Google Project Zero, allowing any process on any device unrestricted access to unauthorized memory. What makes these bugs particularly dangerous is that they don't behave like any software bug we've seen before, as they don't rely on exploiting any fundamental weakness or flaws in any code. These vulnerabilities are baked into the very essence of modern CPU technology, attacking underlying CPU microarchitectures. Meltdown is a more specific type of attack, only affecting Intel CPUs manufactured after 1995. This made it somewhat easier to fix, involving increased separation between different memory spaces. Spectre, on the other hand, is much more sinister. It is a whole class of attacks that take advantage of something called speculative execution and branch prediction, which are hardware-level features present on all modern CPUs, pervasive across all CPU manufacturers and architectures, present in virtually every desktop, laptop, server, and smartphone in the world. Because this is not a bug or flaw in any software, but rather a fundamental hardware issue, it's incredibly difficult to properly patch it. The United States Computer Emergency Readiness Team's recommendation was to replace your CPU, stating, fully removing the vulnerability requires replacing vulnerable CPU hardware. In order to understand the mechanics at the heart of Spectre, we're first going to need a foundational understanding of how computers work, specifically their memory. What does execution on a modern computer look like? You have the CPU, which is responsible for processing data, and the memory, which stores data. During regular execution, the CPU will constantly be reading and writing data to and from memory. 
it's going to be helpful to visualize memory as a long sequence of boxes, where each box contains one byte of information. Now, this type of memory is the main system memory, also known as DRAM, short for Dynamic Random Access Memory. While it is relatively large in capacity, it is very slow to read and write from. Let's say your CPU wants to load some data in from memory. This retrieval process is incredibly slow, let's say in the order of 200 nanoseconds. Every single time you need to access something in memory, your CPU is going to need to wait for the incredibly slow main memory to respond with the data that it wants. It turns out that there's additional layers of memory, called cache memory, to make this process faster. Once a particular memory location is accessed for the first time, the CPU is going to store a copy in its cache. Accessing the CPU cache is blazingly fast, achieving sub-nanosecond speeds, however its capacity is quite small relative to DRAM. The next time the same memory location is accessed, the CPU can just get the data directly out of its cache without needing to wait for a call to the main memory. Something interesting to note about the cache is that it's not directly readable, essentially being transparent to the program being ran. There's no direct way to know if the specific byte of memory you're accessing is in cache, or if it's coming from main memory. Now, the cache only speeds things up for data that has already been accessed from the main memory at least once before. Over the regular course of execution, you're inevitably going to run into the fact that your program is going to need to read some data from main memory, bottlenecking the CPU. Let's visualize this with an example. Let's say we have some variable mem defined in memory, and only if mem is equal to true do we want to execute a bunch of other instructions. If mem is not already in cache, we'll need to load it in from main memory, taking upwards of 200 nanoseconds. During this memory retrieval process, the CPU is going to be forced to sit idly by as it waits for this slow response from memory, which is an absurd way to have a CPU operate. Only after the value of mem is retrieved from memory can the CPU start executing the rest of the instructions. Needless to say, it is very inefficient to have our CPU idle during the long memory lookup process. What if after starting the retrieval process, we could get a head start, sprinting ahead and executing our instructions speculatively, so that we're already done by the time we receive the value of mem? This is called speculative execution, which is an optimization technique present in virtually every CPU since the 1990s, and it's actually one of the reasons why modern CPUs are so fast. Anytime we have a branch, such as this if statement, the CPU has some logic that makes an intelligent guess about which way the branch might go. This is called a branch prediction. If the CPU thinks that it's likely for mem to be equal to true, it can sprint ahead and speculatively execute these instructions even before it gets its response from memory. Once the lookup is finally complete, if we guessed right, and mem is indeed equal to true, we just saved a lot of time, as our instructions are already executed. We can keep everything we just did, which is called a commit, and resume execution from this point on. This sounds pretty cool, however we obviously need to handle the case where we get the guess wrong, meaning that everything done speculatively needs to be fully reversible. If we guessed wrong, and mem was not equal to true, we would need to roll back all of the changes that were made, including reverting all of the register values, which is called a discard. Here's where things start to get interesting. Let's introduce the flaw that Spectre was exploiting. It turns out that when the branch predictor makes an incorrect guess, and we roll back all of the changes that were made during speculative execution, the state of the CPU cache is actually not reverted. Let's make this clear. The code being speculatively executed might have triggered some data to be loaded in from main memory, resulting in it getting cached. If it turns out that we made a bad call, and everything needs to be rolled back, the data is actually going to remain within the CPU cache, even after the rollback. This is quite serious, keeping in mind that from the software point of view, this code was quite literally never executed. We're soon going to see that Spectre can induce one of these rollbacks by training the CPU's branch predictor, artificially conditioning it to make a bad call on purpose. The tricky part is going to be extracting this information from the cache, as its contents are not directly readable, essentially being transparent. Since we know that the cache responds faster than main memory, the contents of the cache can be inadvertently leaked with a timing attack, measuring the amount of time it takes to retrieve the data. This alone seems easy, but to be able to do this on unauthorized memory is going to be quite tricky. However, we're soon going to see an incredibly elegant solution to bring data from unauthorized memory into a part of the CPU's cache that we can probe, but I digress, let's not get ahead of ourselves. With this, we now have all the ingredients needed to understand Spectre. 
If you've made it this far and you're interested in learning new skills, advancing your career, and building a comprehensive understanding of software engineering concepts, look no further than this video's sponsor, CodeCrafters. With CodeCrafters, you learn by building your own versions of real technologies, such as BitTorrent, Docker, or even Redis. Each project dives deep into a specific topic, starting from scratch to final specification, in a practical, hands-on environment. The cool thing is that all of these challenges are available in a wide variety of programming languages, meaning that you can learn language-specific skills or new languages entirely in a real-world environment regardless of what the original tool is written in. You can get started with any setup. As you progress through the different stages, you'll be conveniently pushing your code for automatic grading. The whole time, you'll have access to hints, code examples, and even screencasts from fellow community members if you get stuck. In addition to this, any knowledge gaps will be filled in along the way, as interactive tutorials are provided to teach you fundamental concepts when needed. You can get started with CodeCrafters today by clicking the link in the description. They're offering a free tier and a 40% discount on their paid memberships to viewers of this channel. Thanks again to CodeCrafters for supporting the channel. Now, let's get back to Spectre. Let's go ahead and set the scene, starting with our main memory. The operating system kernel is responsible for allocating this memory to different applications. A similar thing also happens in multi-tenanted cloud environments as well, with the hypervisor allocating memory to different virtual machines instead. In either case, this means that there could be adjacent parts of memory allocated to a process that we control and to a potential victim. The operating system is supposed to isolate the memory spaces between different processes, ensuring that any given process, including the JavaScript running within your browser, can't access another process's memory. So, how does Spectre circumvent this, enabling us to read data from a victim process? Let's start by initializing an array in the part of memory that we control. We know that we can access the elements within our array by indexing into whatever position that we want to retrieve. All this does under the hood is some simple pointer arithmetic, adding together the memory location of the start of the array and the index in order to find the memory location that we want. Let's suppose that the part of victim memory that we're trying to read from contains the number 6, but of course, our code doesn't know this. What if we tried to index into a position so high that we went out of bounds and read from victim memory? Let's call this array of x. If you try to do this, the operating system is going to notice that we're trying to access unauthorized memory, deeming this an illegal operation, triggering a fault, preventing us from accessing the data. Now, what if we instead tried to do this operation speculatively? This is going to be interesting. So we want to index into our array at position x, but how can we force this operation to be done speculatively? We're going to need to add some sort of branch beforehand. Let's go ahead and add a simple bounds check, making sure that x is within the bounds of the array before proceeding. Simple. What we're going to do now is we're actually going to train the CPU's branch predictor, conditioning it to determine that it is likely for x to be in bounds. We can do this by making repeated calls to this function, handing it values of x that are always in bounds. If it keeps on seeing that x tends to be in bounds, it is going to become conditioned to speculatively execute the body of the if statement, since there's a very high chance that the bounds check will pass based off its previous interactions. There is malicious intent here, as once the CPU has been trained, we can hand it a value of x that is purposefully out of bounds, and our CPU will happily speed ahead, speculatively executing the instruction. So, how is this handled? The CPU is going to index into array of x, however it won't know that it's out of bounds yet. If this were to actually be ran, the kernel would kill the process, but the speculative execution engine just looks ahead and reads the number 6 from victim memory. The operating system won't actually check if it's accessing an illegal memory location until later. This is a crucial nuance to understand. As a result, data from victim memory was indeed accessed. This is very interesting, but once the CPU realizes that it's gone the wrong way, it's going to roll back all of the erroneous work that it's done. Even though illegal memory has been accessed, its contents will be forgotten. We need to find a way to retain it after the rollback. If it can't be retained, then all of this was for nothing. Bear with me on this. We're actually going to define a second, larger array to capture this information, akin to casting a large net. Let's modify our code slightly to index into capture of array of x. When array of x is evaluated to the number 6, capture of 6 is now going to be accessed. This is the crucial part of the attack. Because we just read from the capture array at index 6, this memory location is going to be put into the cache. 
After the rollback, as we now know, the cache is going to remain intact. Think about that. We never directly stole the data from victim memory. We just brought an element of our own array into cache at the index number that corresponded to the data that we wanted to steal. It's quite an elegant trick. Don't forget that the cache itself is still not accessible to us. The last step is going to be a timing attack, which is a specific type of side channel attack that's going to try and deduce the data contained within the cache by taking advantage of the timing differences between cache and main memory. We can go ahead and access each and every element of our capture array, timing how long it takes to retrieve each element. We're going to get a sequence of slow, 200 nanosecond cache misses until finally we get a near instant cache hit. Since we found our cache hit on array element 6, we know that the data contained within the victim memory was the number 6. It's quite a beautiful attack. Spectre comes in many different variations. What I just outlined was a highly simplified version of Spectre Variant 1, although they all rely on the same idea, getting the CPU to speculatively run some code that illegally accesses memory, and then exfiltrating said memory using a timing side channel on the CPU cache. If you're interested in more vulnerability breakdowns, check out these videos, and subscribe to the channel for more content. Thanks for watching.